Audio Drama Production Podcast Episode 29. Get inside your listener's head with Dirk Mags. The Audio Drama Production Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Audio Drama Production Podcast uh, and a special welcome to new listeners. You can get us at audiodramaproduction.com, our website home if you like, as well as getting us on the usual Facebook group, Audio Drama Production Podcast. So, Matthew, you've just finished speaking to Dirk Mags. Yeah, great chat with a great guy. Really thoroughly enjoyed it and I'm sure the listener and yourself will enjoy it as well. Um, and it's a it's a big lad this interview. Uh, there was loads to talk about and get through, so uh, I think we should just press right on, shouldn't we? Onwards and upwards, go for it. Uh, my name is Dirk Mags. I'm um, an audio producer, ex BBC Radio Light Entertainment producer. I now work uh, as a freelance, but um, still mainly for the BBC, and most recently. I have been working with Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett on BBC Radio 4's production of Good Omens. Previous to that, I worked on Neverwhere with Neil as a, an audio production with uh, James McAvoy, Benedict Cumberbatch and a very starry cast. And in my history, I uh, was the person who Douglas Adams asked to finish The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy in its original medium, which of course was radio. Derek, welcome to the show. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on. Thank you, Matthew. How does it feel to be on the at least eighth best audio drama production podcast in Scotland? Oh, uh, this is by by far the most prestigious honour I have had this morning. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Derek, I was I was speaking. We've got a a wee active community of like minded aspiring producers and writers and voice actors and things like that on our Facebook group. So I'd mentioned to the folks there that you were coming on the show and if they'd any questions for you. And uh, I don't think any of them will get you in any trouble. <laughs> if you don't mind, I'll, I'll fire away. I've had one myself first, so um, just wondering sort of how you got into audio drama production in the very beginning. Um, I got into audio drama by a very strange kind of back route. I joined the BBC as a studio manager because it was one of the ways that you could get in and get a training in some kind of or discipline at the BBC um, straight from, in my case, uh, teacher training college as it was then. Of course, it's now a university. Um, and um, trained as a BBC studio manager, which was basically operating sound desks and playback equipment, which in those days was, of course, quarter-inch tape machines and uh, gramophone desks. Um, and um, But my actual aim was to get into television, but I knew that the, the trick was to get in the BBC first and then work your way to television. But it was sheer luck. I have no idea what I would have done if the BBC hadn't taken me on because I, I applied for no other jobs. Um, and uh, But I got in, and, and but within a year and a half of training to be a studio manager and passing the test and, and working, I decided I would wanted to work at the World Service, which was where they did the overseas programs, because you got your hands on the desks more quickly. But I actually wanted to get into television, so I got a what they call an attachment, which is like a secondment to television network directing, which is stitching together the evening's programs on BBC One and BBC Two, and also making the television trailers in those days and um i did that for a year and a half and i really thought i because i thought i could get maybe get into television comedy or television drama but i just really didn't enjoy television at all it was it seemed a very very small world and and rather limited and the technically and, and in those days before there was no such thing as widescreen let alone hd there was very little you know uh, sort of ability to do anything that didn't feel very very enclosed and claustrophobic so I went back to radio and sort of had to think about what I really did want to do and it was no I, I wanted to make films but there was no film industry over here at the time particularly and and the sort of films I wanted to make were so epic and huge that there was no way I could never ever have achieved that um and then I thought well what's my you know what else can I do and the one thing I always used to love was radio comedy I was a big fan of things like the goon show and um I'm sorry I'll read that again and 
um, Round the Horn, all the comedy shows I grew up with as a kid, which now no one remembers, which were very funny at the time and, and many still hold up. And there was a, a radio light entertainment department and I worked my way into radio light entertainment Worked my way up the ladder to become a senior producer there, um, during which time I managed to do some stuff like Superman and Batman, as well as the regular comedy stuff. They, we were allowed to do what they called light drama, which I guess was not the opposite to heavy drama. If heavy drama was like Chekhov and Shakespeare, light drama was, you know, kind of... Um, gr I, was, I can't remember. The, the King Street Junior, there was, there was one about a primary school which a lovely producer called John Force at Wilson used to do. Um, but I proposed doing Superman and Batman, and, and, I'm, and I got away with it. They let me do it. Um, and they went rather well. And because they went well, um, a bloke called Douglas Adams rang my boss and said, um, I've heard this bloke, Mags, seems to be able to uh, put a program together that's quite adventurous. I'm looking for someone to finish Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy in its original medium. Um, and, um, and so, uh, I began my association with Douglas. And although our first attempt to do that didn't happen when I left the BBC to go freelance in 1995 and I was making, um, these superhero things, judge dread, Spider-Man, Superman, Batman, um, there seemed to be a bit of, you know, a career in that. And, um, so I became a freelance and, and carried on kind of doing the same thing. Although, um, ironically, the minute I gave up the BBC, all the job, all the work dried up. But that's a common story for freelancers. And so, you know, um, I kind of wiggled my way up. But drama seemed I, I seem to end up with drama, although really anything I do has got a lot of comedy in it, hopefully. Or at least there's a comedy aspect to it, because I don't think uh, there is life without comedy. It's just too awful otherwise. So that's it, really. Dirk, it sounds like, you know, what you're saying and, and listening to your productions, it doesn't sound at all like you were influenced by the old-time radio-type production. You know, your stuff feels very cinematic. Is that is that a fair assessment? Absolutely. Um, really, I'm a frustrated film director, but there was no way I could ever make the films I wanted to make with uh, with uh, cameras and, and film. Um, so I was... I realized quite early on before I ever got into this business in the, um, I suppose seventies, a lot of the old Hollywood film stars started dying off all the old classic film stars. And I do remember listening to things like news and the today program on the radio, uh, when you'd hear them, you know, do a sort of uh, obituary for Betty Davis or someone like that. And they would play a, a bit of one of the films, this, just the sound. And of course, film soundtracks got all this other stuff on, like Foley, you know, the sound of people walking around and moving and picking up things and so on. So they play this little bit of a scene to remember this star by. But in the background, you'd hear all these noises going on. And of course, there were no pictures telling you what all the noises were. But you could still hear, um, you could still make a picture from from what you were hearing uh, 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 in your head. Uh, of the scene that was being played out and that stayed with me and when I started doing audio I thought listening to radio drama and I I'm, was a big fan of things like Under Milk Wood which was the early 50s production with Richard Burton and it was just a play for voices literally no sound effects whatsoever I think maybe a couple but nothing huge um, and the writing was you know it was Dylan Thomas it was so amazing and the acting was so superb that that was about the only time that I felt radio drama, which is voices alone, um, really worked for me. Um, uh, but a lot of radio drama was the sort of, you know, little rattling teacups and, and doors opening and, and the rest of it with voices played out against, you know, very quiet or even non-existent backgrounds. And it just felt horribly claustrophobic. So I wanted to play with sound. And when we was first doing the Supermans, which was at the end of the 80s, um, uh, Superman on trial, and then we did Batman, the Lazarus Syndrome, which were kind of docudramas. Um, I, I thought, I, I want these to sound, I want to actually create the sound of Metropolis or Gotham City. I want to actually, you put a pair of headphones on you or um, put your earbuds in, which we didn't have then, of course. it was We had Walkmans, but not iPods. But you could actually go into that world. And I went to see 
films. I used to take lunch break and go down to Lower Regent Street Theatre and watch films and listen to the soundtracks. I, I remember going to see uh, Thelma and Louise and I think and definitely Terminator 2. That gave me a lot of ideas. Um, and it was the sound design on films that inspired me. So that's made made me go back and I remember being in one of the studios doing Superman with um, Tim Sturgeon who was doing the panel and Wilfredo Acosta who was doing the um, uh, sound effects uh, Wilfie who actually was on panel recently for Good Omens you know we've stayed mates uh, since um, and I said to them I said I don't know how we're going to do this but this is we've got to try and make this sound like a film and they said well what, uh, what exactly have you in mind and I said well everything's got to be louder than everything else um, and the thing is, of course, at that point, although I was a trained sound engineer, sort of, I didn't know, we didn't have digital. So I didn't know about how much you could get away with in terms of generations of added sound effects and compression and all the plugins that you can use now. I just knew these films sounded amazing and they were all using this cutting, cutting edge technology. So really it was, it was discovering what the sound I wanted to make which felt to me to be as good as any picture I could create with a camera. Um, and then it was a matter of working out how, what technology we needed to do it. And in the BBC at that time, the technology simply wasn't there. So, and Tim and Wolf were fantastic and we did make Superman sound really good. But later on, you know, when I discovered digital technology, it lifted everything to a higher level. And I, I realized that we could paint some very, very enormous pictures. Brings me on, interestingly, to, to one of the questions we got in from EC, because he was wondering how you felt about the studio versus field recording approach. Are you are you very much a studio guy? Um, I don't mind where we record as long as I can get the dialogue clean. Um, but I used to think recording on location was pretty pointless because the microphones, the, the technology really made everyone sound like they were in the studio anyway. That was the joke. Um, but as the equipment has gotten better, and certainly as digital technology has turned things around, I think it's, I think it's different now. I, I, I think actually you can do a lot with location recording. And I've done, I did um, a play with Johnny Vegas called Interiors, which we actually recorded in Johnny's house with a cast of about nine. And we did that entirely on portable recorders, walking around with this group of people as Johnny playing the, this character was showing them around his house and all sorts of dramas were being played out. And I have to say, that was really enjoyable. And having done that with Johnny, kind of confirmed for me that location recording is a different deal now. And with the microphones and digital technology we have, if you do it well, it sounds amazing. Very immersive, very good. That said, I still took it away and added layers of Foley and backgrounds and so on, because the way I work, the, um, the voices I'm recording are just the front layer in a very layered world I'm creating because I believe you should have something that's really immersive and, and, and that, you know, beyond your, your foreground actors are your background actors. And then you've got the immediate sort of street scene, and then you've got the sky beyond and the world beyond that and the solar system beyond that, you know, you work back in layers, the richer it is, as long as the dialogue is clear and the backgrounds are sympathetic to the dialogue, you have created a world. Now, when I'm talking to people in, if you know, in your position, with no budget, who want to do audio stuff, create these these movies for the mind using audio, I recommend that they go out on location, take a portable recorder like an H2 or an H4 or the Edirolls or, or whatever you can get. Take a portable recorder and play with it. Work out how to get the best result, the best balance of voices with background without it being too clattery or too distant or too echoey because you immediately remove one problem which is setting your action somewhere atmospheric you've already found that so I, as soon as somebody says to me oh i'd love to do it but i can't afford a studio i say you don't need a studio if you have one of these little recorders and once you've got one of these little recorders you can go anywhere do pretty much anything so um, I'm a big advocate of recording on location, although when we did Neverwhere, I talked to Heather about, you know, 
we talked about going into London underground stations at night and recording the cast and so on. But frankly, for all the hassle of doing an overnight record with, you know, people like James and Benedict, who really would rather be, you know, at home. Um, uh, and in order to get a, a, a reverb, basically, on the voices, because that would be it. I mean, it would have been very useful for me to get all the physical movement and so on. But we thought we could really do that in the studio and pretty much achieve the same thing. And because we had the budget to do it, there wasn't a question about, well, can we afford that? In fact, it was probably cheaper to do it in the studio than to get a location team out and, and the catering and whatever else we had to do to keep these big stars warm and cosy. Um, so, um, you know, it, 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 you, you, there are choices. When you have choices, you make the best choice for the logistics and, and, and the artistic side of what you're doing. But if you don't have choices, location recording is just fantastically useful with today's technology. Again, a good segue that you've obviously got a sneaky copy of my questions here because uh, <laughs> Eli is uh, interested in your recording technique and he wonders if you allow actors to move around as they would on a stage or set. He asks, are they off book at that point or are they still holding scripts or sets? Um, no, I, I absolutely love actors to move around and... The thing about a stereo microphone is, um, you know, you hear about James Cameron and um, Peter, um, what's his face, who did the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit, uh, going on about um, 3D and all of this and 48, you know, frames per second and, you know, all this sort of, all these things to make cinema more convincing and more like a holographic experience. And of course, just simple invention of, crossing two microphones into a stereo pair uh, a century, century ago um, also created um, a, a 3D image. As soon as you put a pair of headphones on listening to a stereo source, you're effectively in that 3D space. Um, and if you're in a 3D space and your actors are working in a 3D space, if they're moving around, then they're actually working around your head. They work around inside and outside of your head, depending on, you know, how you're listening so yeah absolutely i encourage the actors to move around um sometimes um because of logistics i'm forced to route them to the spot when i'm recording them and then in post i will pan their voice around the room with matching foley footsteps or whatever principally the last scene in good the big climax scene in good omens where um the angel and the demon are confronting the the eleven year old Antichrist in this on this airbase. We had a cast of twelve um, to get into a relatively small space to do that, and so I couldn't move people around. So that involved a lot of post production panning and pulling, which was entirely tiresome and boring. I would much rather have just had the cast move around um, uh, because it's immediately more realistic, and also. Um, when somebody turns to say someone to something to their, um, you know, if Aziraphale turned to Crowley to say, I don't think he wants to do it as a sort of quiet whisper, then you can actually hear him sort of bend into that other person. Physical movement reads on a stereo mic. It actually reads on a mono mic too. If you've got a mono mic and you want a character to bend down and pick something up while they're talking, you can hear the voice go through a sort of change because of the, the way in which the, the mouth as a sort of you know instrument and 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 projecting your, your your vocal cords and everything else that's going on moves in relation to the microphone. You move off mic and you move back on mic. Um, so the microphone is a, is is a movement sensor and a stereo pair is 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 basically a holographic sensor. You've got a three D image in your head of the actors moving. And um, I always remember the when we did the very first Batman thing we did. Um, one of the critics on the radio um, said, oh, it was just as if Robin moved behind Batman in that scene. It was so realistic. And, of course, Robin did move behind Batman in that scene. That was, you know, the movement by the actors. And as for are they off book, um, no, they're not. They're all carrying scripts. They're just being very quiet. Either they're very quiet or, and here's another tip, if you really... You know, uh, if if you've got a long scene with a lot of page turns with a bunch of actors and page turn noise is a problem, then uh, all you need to do is 
change um oh, sorry all you need to do is tell everyone to do a very big noisy page turn at the same time at the end of each page and then cut it out in post it's much easier to say right everybody be very noisy on this in this set moment and you can find those set moments and cut them out than to have a, a an entire mess of page turns which mess up about three lines over as you as you go over the page another one matthew is 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 also people don't think about this but you know, people reading a script will put their head down and immediately their mouth turns away from the microphone if it's in front of them. Um, uh, and the thing is always to remember to tell the actors, keep your mouth, wherever your eyes are pointed, keep your mouth pointed at the microphone. And they'll soon soon learn to hold their script somewhere they can read it and keep their mouth at the microphone. Um, ideally not in front of the microphone. Of course, that's the other thing that actors do. And professional actors do this all the time as well. Um, there are a lot of professional actors who then come in and, and haven't done radio before. And I spend my life, you know, taking them through the basics of, of how to work to a microphone. But when they get it, that's fine. That's, that's definitely something as well that, that's come up because uh, we, we've got like a, a small one-man vocal booth and when the actor's in there, I can't see them. So I'm outside with the headphones yeah. and the, the preamp. And there is those moments, especially on a longer line, where you do hear the voice going down to the script and back up. And I'm saying through to them, no, you're looking away from the mic. And they're like, how do you know? But uh, <laughs> you, you could totally hear it, can't you? Yes, totally. No, And, and it's, it's really um, irritating if you don't have talk back because you've got to get up, take your cans off, go bang on the door, go in, ask them, open two doors, shut, ask them to stop doing it and then go back. And the whole mood is lost. So kind of explaining the ground rules in advance does help uh, uh, avoid that sometimes. Uh, Bryce was wondering about the kind of direction you give to actors and do they actually hear music and sound effects whilst they're performing or is that all added in post-production? Um, mostly... When we're working with actors, mostly they are just performing cold. And I apologise to them and say, imagine you're working green screen. Because as I've gone on, and, and let me, well, there's a kind of history to this. When we were first working, when we did the first Superman, we added everything as per a regular radio drama. Um, when we did Super, This is Superman on trial I'm talking about. Back, way back in the dark ages and this was in studio made of l11 that made of l in north the uh, northwest london and we the bbc studio there and we were able to uh do everything it was a large traditional drama studio which had a parquet hard parquet floor with mics slung over it I mean, you could move the mics around had a kitchen area had stairs with a carpet concrete and wood treads I mean, it was beautiful. It was a real traditional radio studio, working kitchen with sinks that ran. I mean, just amazing. Because, of course, in those days when you recorded drama, you did it all in one go, quite possibly, you know, originally would, would have been live. That was the paradigm. Now we record in rooms not much bigger than most people's living rooms. Um, uh, and when we did that, we, we did Superman on trial. And we actually rigged a courtroom in the room. We put the judge behind a table. We had a little platform for people giving evidence to stand on. I remember Dave Gibbons from, you know, of, of Watchmen fame coming in and giving evidence on Super as a witness for the defense for Superman and standing up and being grilled by Bill Hootkins, who was playing Lex Luthor brilliantly. And, um, and it was brilliant to watch. It was like a piece of theater. Um, but uh, the trouble is, um, it's great doing that, and I love to give the actors all of that to play with, but it's time-consuming because you, you, you have to do a lot more staging um, uh, if you're working in a large space than a small space. So uh, obviously on location, it's worth investing the time to, to, to do that. But generally speaking, nowadays, I've got to get half an hour's worth of stuff recorded in a day. Quite often I've got I mean, if I've got Benedict Cumberbatch coming in, it's great and he's lovely and, and he's fun to work with, but he's got two other gigs that day and I've got him for two hours and we've got all the big scenes he's got in Never Where to Do. I really don't have a lot of time to rehearse playing in stuff, backgrounds and so on. So I say, look, here's the thing. You're in this underground thing. You walk along this long uh, pathway and then you discover such and such and then you're sucked out of this door by this huge wind or something like that and he, he kind of knows where the beats are and 
he can imagine what's going to happen. And obviously, I, we do have to agree, all of us, the actors and and myself, when we are in a situation where it's a noisy environment and, and they have to pitch up, shout a little bit more. Um, that sort of thing goes on. But quite a lot of the time, no, they don't hear the effects. The only, the, the big, the only big uh, exception to that is I try to play in spot effects live, which are the little personal effects like picking up a phone, um, typing on a, a computer keyboard, um, a bit of movement with cloth doors, um, stuff like that. So on Good Omens, Ken, my, my, my pal Ken, who has been, you know, I've worked with for years, who did the sound effects on the, um, the last three Hitchhikers series and also was on the Hitchhikers tour doing them on stage. Uh, we did them together, which was lots of fun. But Ken was there adding the sound of, oh, I don't know, um, Aziraphale rolling up the carpet to summon the Metatron or um, whatever it is. We actually did those in the, in the studio, which is more fun for the actors. I mean, certainly dropping and throwing things is much more fun if you can do it in the studio. It kind of wakes everyone else up as well. If you drop a symbol, it so sure as hell wakes everyone up. I heard a tip once uh, at uni. My, my uni lecturer's pretty into radio drama. And he was saying that this was an example of sort of what you're talking about. They had to say it was a scene where a fire alarm is about to go off. Yeah, and yeah. They play the fire alarm through to the person who's going to react it. But when they actually come to record, the producer will turn the fire alarm way up. <laughs> you know, then nice. it's that real sense of urgency. Uh, if you're just saying to a voice actor, now you've got to react to this fire alarm and they can't hear anything, you're probably yes. not going to capture it, are you? No, that's true. That's true. Although I hesitate to blow someone like Christopher Lee's ears out. <laughs> I think I might ask him to to imagine me doing it, but but no. If there's a particular sound they need to hear, I I, I have, and and sometimes I will, I will play them back the scene we just recorded with the effect in to show them either that it's worked very very well or that it hasn't worked and we need to do some more work on it. So yeah, it's it's a it's it's an ongoing thing, ongoing thing. Uh, here's a question from me. Do, do you have any particular favourite pieces of kit, microphones, equipment, DAWs, things like that? Not really. Um, you know, like many people, it's it's what you learn on is what you stay with. Um, I tend to... What do we use? Well, I use Pro Tools as my workstation because that's what I learned on. Um, um, it has its vices and virtues it just is what i'm used to working with i have no that does that's not putting any other systems down i do like the fact you work all in one window on pro tools where in the certainly 20 years ago when it i began learning this oh, a little more than that now sadly um uh, i like a uh, i like a, a workstation where you don't have to open a ton of windows and there was another a workstation where you had to open three windows just to do an edit and uh, I, I've just I don't work that way I, I start in the days of tape and sticky uh, of, of quarter inch recording tape sticky tape and razor blades and china graph pencils and I, it, uh, what I needed was a digital system where I could edit as quickly as I could um, audio regular analog audio tape and audio tape if you could edit quickly it was very useful because quite often on the news program on the World Service, the first half of the program was going out on one tape while you were still editing the second half. So there wasn't any question of, you know, going slow. So anything that was fast and I found I could work fast on Pro Tools. So that was just my thing. Uh, partic uh, similarly, microphones, good quality microphone I'll always work with. Um, what I particularly, what we have what we used on Good Omens and Neverwhere and most of the other productions were um, Neumann stereo, uh, stereo Neumanns, which is a microphone with a with which you hang vertically and it's got two um, uh, capsules on the bottom that you can rotate to to sort of pick up a stereo uh, picture. But um, we also use uh, rifle mics, uh, good, very very high quality. Um, kind of rifle mics uh, which are used as individual microphones they're very very directional so you have to get right in front of them to work them that's so that we can really 
um, get very clean voice recordings if in, in a multi-voice situation. That's very useful for doing exteriors because what you don't want is a lot of spill um, between microphones. Uh, if you've got a multicast thing uh, on exterior and you're not working to a stereo pair, stereo pair like the Neumann, you can move people around in front of in a sort of <clears throat> quadrant and that will read you that you then will be able to read um their movements that's that's the sort of you know when you move your cast about if i've got you know a dozen casts in a small studio to do the big climax of good omens as i was talking about earlier then i will you know we'll stand them in front of these individual rifle mics and i'll move them around later all i want is as clean a voice recording with as little spill as possible and they give me that um but i tell you what in terms of you know um most mic decent mics that you can use now if you are recording for your own fun and pleasure um such as the the stereo pairs you'll get on an h2 or an h4 uh, more the more the ones where there's a, a pair of mics pointing at each other on the end of the <clears throat> the recorder they they are, they're just they're very good they're very good and i have used um an h4 a zoom h4 um, we used those on the Johnny Johnny Vegas thing. I used they were my principal mics. Um, for individual mics, if I want a good quality voice mic, just bog standard good quality, the Shure SM58, the the classic vocalists mic from for bands, um, is is a brilliant microphone. It works fantastically well. You can drop it. You can kick it. You can dunk it in water it'll tend to still work afterwards it only costs about 60 pounds um you can get on amazon you know or wherever not amazon ebay wherever um you can get this for you know with a stand for less than 100 quid that's a professional microphone and i've used that for um recording actors uh stephen moore marvin for the touring hitchhiker show he pre-recorded his lines at my house using my sm58 i use of the band they they're, they're pretty much indestructible so um the only thing is that they have a i don't know if they do a usb version of that if you're working straight into a computer you'll need to look at a usb mic but i could be wrong so um yeah that's kind of it really so no i'm not it's most technology if you know, if you're going to spend twenty pounds on a on a recorder, you're probably not going to get something that'll last more than five minutes. You you need to invest a little bit, but you know you can equip yourself relatively very cheaply. And of course, if you're still a student, you can raid the 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 equipment cupboard at the university, college, or wherever you are. You know, but that's one of the things I would say as well. If you're a student and you're doing this, but crying out loud. Use everything you can while it's free because it's, you know, you, you, you don't realize till you leave and you think, God, oh, all that stuff we had, rehearsal space, equipment, edit facilities, and I had it all for free and now I've got a charge, I'm going to get charged. So uh, I, I would strongly suggest that. Yeah, the, the, the college that I left two years ago, they still can't get rid of me. <laughs> exactly. Stay friends. Stay friends. I think they maybe think I'm something that I'm not, you know, when I come in and say, well, obviously I'm a, I'm a radio drama producer, but uh, <laughs> you've got to put a wee spin on it, don't you? You absolutely do. I've just looked this up, by the way. You can get a USB adapter for an SM58. Um, it's, it's expensive, so you can probably do better, but, but, but sure, make one. And I'm sure that there's, there'll be cheaper, cheaper ch Chinese versions out there. But, you know, if you want a single voice mic, that sounds fantastic. The SM58 was, you know, is is a classic and rightly so. Funnily enough, Dirk, that's what we use. We use the the SMs, and uh, we can run two of those through a Focusrite Scarlett preamp into the USB uh, into the Mac. I'm I'm standing here with my Focusrite Scarlett preamp right in front of me. So you, I I know exactly what you mean. That was me tapping it. <laughs> Yeah, I feel really vindicated that you've got all the stuff I have. Well, it, you know what? It it does the job. It when we did a, a thing called Voyage, which was a, about the first, supposedly the first manned mission to Mars, and we did it as if NASA did it, like the moon landings. It was very straight drama, and and by Stephen from Stephen Baxter's, Baxter's excellent book. Um, we for the for the astronauts in the capsule, the capsule was um, a Renault Espace 
in the car park of the studio. We put them in a, which is about the same space as a Apollo capsule, um, and we put them in headsets with um, little um, Maplins, you know, two pound ninety nine mics in in paper cups. Uh, attached to their head, uh, headphones with a, a wire coat hanger. And that was our principal source of audio were these £2.99 Maplin mics because it gave the effect of a, you know, a small, poor, a small, poor quality, long, far, far, far away microphone in a very small environment. So as long as you can understand what's being said and it works in the dramatic context, you can do it. I mean, if a tin can with a piece of string would record, and that's the effect you wanted, then use a tin can with a piece of string. If we, When we did Batman, the nightfall, all the stuff where someone was on the radio was genuinely on a walkie-talkie. We gave one actor the walkie-talkie in the studio, another actor outside in the hallway, the other end of the walkie-talkie. So all the squelches and the walkie-talkies were for real. And, and then it's still the best walkie-talkie effect I ever got, simply because it really was a walkie-talkie. Yeah, I'm, I'm reading uh, Rick Veer's uh, location sound book at the moment, and his his message throughout the book is is definitely that technique trumps technology uh, every yes. time. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And people people get hung up on, oh, I must get this plug in, I must get this bit of gear, and so on. Uh, you know what? That that really isn't the point. The point is if you can create atmosphere and you can hear what's being said, and it all works together because it all rings true, that's, you've done it, you've cracked it, you've, you, you're telling a story. If you can keep someone transfixed for half an hour with what you did on a, I don't know, a, a USB snowball mic and a bunch of mates um, and, and, a, and a whole bunch of you know, things from the kitchen and what have you that, that work as sound effects then you, you've done it that's it you've created the magic last couple of questions and, and we really have covered a lot of this already but brian asks if you've any specific advice for new audio drama writers or producers really it's the same advice people uh, neil gives people who want to write neil gamer, gamer which is just do it finish it that's the thing finish it finish it and don't be afraid to play and for god's sake don't uh, don't write something or produce something that you could have done in television because television is such a god awful medium. It just stinks. You can do so much more in radio. You can go anywhere. Use your imagination. Go from the top of Everest to the depth of the Mariana Trench in the Pacific. Um, travel to new worlds. Go inside someone's head. What's go inside and live in their head? You can go microscopic you can go cosmic um you can tell the story in one voice of one person in absolute silence and if that's a dramatic choice that that works dramatically well then do it but on the other hand if you want to tell something this is with the epic sweep of a, a galaxies warring with each other do that but whatever you do don't just do two voices talking against a background where nothing is distinguishable because the two voices and the two voices are are telling don't write two voices telling each other stuff that you could have actually heard we could you could create the picture of them doing reported action is for greek tragedy and bad radio drama good radio drama good audio drama is go and make a world go and paint a picture in sound which um, f makes the imagination uh, create huge, fascinating pictures, even huge, fascinating pictures of tiny things. If it's a man locked in a cell for 20 years and, and, and you are just with him in that cell, you can still explore everything about the human condition and you can do it with colour and texture and light and you're just working in sound. Great words, Derek, and uh, I mean, you know, it's something that we're kind of battling with at the moment. We're trying to move away from being tempted to just write conversations. Uh, we do write, to, we do like to, to write dialogue, but you could do so much more, can't you? And you can you can create a, a story around the dialogue so that it's not just a conversation taking place. You can, conversation is, is obviously necessary, but if you have to have a conversation between two characters and 
there's no way that you can illustrate if one character is telling the other character some series of circumstances that have happened and it needs to be there's no way you can actually dramatize the action that he's describing because i'd normally then say well why don't we just flash back to that actually happening rather than having had to go through it all if you're really forced to do these two people talking then put them in an interesting environment to be talking have them walking down the street have them dodging bullets have them falling off a cliff have them doing something which in itself moves the story forward one of the biggest challenges on batman nightfall was when at the beginning of each episode batman had to whoever whichever character we we needed to get the backstory in because otherwise you wouldn't we had three minutes an episode we had to and in that three minutes we had to get the backstory in we had to have one major incident happen one turning point one big story beat happen and we had to end on a cliffhanger even if the cliffhanger was door opens what the anything like that you know we we had to do that but even then, I would, if at all possible, avoid having the two characters just talk about what had happened. And I, uh, so I, but I do remember, I, but uh, so even if you introduce a piece of technology, like for example, um, one episode opened in the Batcave and you just had the big breakout from Arkham Asylum. And, and the first thing I think you hear is, Instead of Batman telling Robin what's happened, you hear the Batcave computer switch on and say, list of escapees from Arkham Asylum, Joker, Amygdala, Penguin, da 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 da. And so it wasn't immediately there was another, there was there was this technology take, took this over. And then you, and then that kept going. And then Batman and Robin had a conversation over the top about what to do next. So we got the backstory and the, and and setting up the next bit simultaneously. Anything to avoid, just don't freaking have two voices talking at each other. If you can possibly make it more dynamic, interesting, illustrated, colourful, etc., etc. Brings me up again nicely to my next question, because one of our favourite audio dramas, it's an online drama produced in America called Edict Zero FIS. Mm. They, they've you know, it's feature length shows, no narration, and they do a lot of this. It's because it's a huge story world on a you know a different planet basically, and it's always there's a a video in the background playing a documentary. There's a TV going, uh, there's a news bulletin, and this is all happening underneath the dialogue, and it's constantly feeding you the information of how this world is constructed in the background of it. And yes. you never at any point need this narrator to step in and say, and of course, you know, years ago this happened and, and this happened. It just keeps the whole thing flowing. You, f- you completely forget that you're listening to a work of fiction. I love that. And it, it, it's, it, that's a great, you know, it's fun to play with that. You, you really can do it. There was a scene in Good Omens, I forgot which episode, three or four, where... Um, Charlotte as anathema as the radio on. I mean, th- th- there's a lot of reference to the radio in the book, thank God. And um, this is the World at One. And we got Martha Carney, who does the World at One, you know, on Radio 4 every lunchtime to be interviewing this bloke who's talking about how the nuclear reactor has completely disappeared from this um, re- uh, reactor. The core has been nicked. And he's talking about how she-, she asked if it was terrorists. And he says, well, I think they'd have to be very strong terrorists because it's 40 feet high or something like that. You know, it's a nice bit. But I had to get that in. And I had to get the sense of Charlotte on the phone talking about something else. And th- it was really fun <clears throat> on the on Pro Tools. And, you know, I mean, and, and other DAWs will do this where um to try and get the salient point of each of each conversation to appear on its own highlighted and then drop under the dialogue of the other conversation uh, 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 have a rather dull bit and because originally I didn't write it that way so it was kind of something I did in post because I, I realized I didn't have enough time to get both in um, and I thought it might work and I'm, I think it did work and it was fun to do and it was kind of that exercise and I think setting yourself challenges like that is really fun and you can play with stuff um michael says he'd be interested to know if you get the chance to listen to any audio drama outside of the the sort of bbc productions and if you have a favorite and also what's your thoughts on the future of audio drama in general at the bbc 
that's a very good point. I, do you know what? I don't listen to a lot. I think because it's the day job <laughs> and people want me to listen to things and it's so kind of them and, and it's lovely and I'm very, you know, honoured to be asked. But actually, I kind of, by the time I've got to the end of a production like Good Omens, my brain is oozing out of my ears and I think that's when I go and... Um, <clears throat> what should we say? I go and watch a Steve Martin film or something like that, you know, any uh, or anything, or go and play in the bands. I play in I play in bands as well, so I don't listen to as much as I should. So when someone says, um, "Oh, well, have you heard such and such a postcard a, po- a podcast?" I have to zoom off and listen to it. But I, I do kind of, I do have, have an ear to what's going on, you know. I will like they do War and Peace all in one day on Radio 4, I'll go and have a quick listen to half an hour of it. I'm not going to sit down for 10 hours and listen, you know. But I'm, I'm, I'm a bit naughty, but then on the other hand, I sort of think, well, I've spent enough time sitting listening. My brain is a bit tired of it. So I should listen to more, and a uh, big slap on the wrist for me. What was the other part of the question? Sorry, Matthew. Uh, it was what, what your thoughts on the future of audio drama in general? Oh, uh, well, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I just... I think it's got so much more of a future than it had 15, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, when now, because people are realising what a fantastic storytelling medium it is, um, and they're playing with it, like, you know, you guys are doing it. I mean, when I say playing with it, I'm not, that's not, I'm not saying that in a bad way. I'm saying, isn't it fantastic that you're able to, to, to it's a toy box you can play in, and, and it's just as good a toy box as uh, cameras and film. And one of the things when I'm talking to students about it, um, and I'm talking about writing for the medium, and a lot of them say, well, I, I say, well, how many people want to write for film and television? How many people want to write for radio? And of course, everybody's hands goes up when I say film and television. And I, I say to them, well, you know, the thing is, of course, that if you want to work in the visual media, you can't get much more visual than audio because it works in the way it does. And if you want to make films, if you want to write films, audio is a great way to actually audition your script without going to all the trouble of getting a camera, lights, uh, costumes, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. You can actually find out whether your work, whether your writing works um, in a visual sense without even bothering to hire a camera or borrow one. Um, Because it does... It's a brilliant medium for trying stuff out in, and uh, you know it, it is effective um, as a as a sort of training tool um, and as a as a sort of pre production tool as well. I mean, I we have I have been involved in visual projects where the first pass was just on audio to dramatize up the script and add sound effects and music. So um, uh, it it has there is great potential for it as a learning as a sort of sketch pad but as a audio medium in itself no i don't think the future's ever been brighter really because for so many years <clears throat> it's been the poor relation the internet has turned things around the internet and digital technology have turned it around and what interests me very much is i mean it, it i think it's great that you guys are doing this but also that I have people getting in touch with me from the States where radio drama is dead in the United States and has been for 40 years. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think the last, you know, sort of stuff of note was, was things like the fire sign theater, radio theater, which was really kind of comedy as well. So, you know, kind of, you know, isn't drama. Uh, maybe it goes back to, you know, sort of, uh, the, um, the the X things the 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 sort of science fiction things of the fifties that Ray Bradbury and company used to write for, but um, you know uh, America suddenly rediscovered audio drama, but not the rate. It's not the networks who rediscovered it. It's just people who love it, and so there are tons of people who do you know this thing about recording each other at great distance and then stitching it all together, directing over Skype, recording on at each other's homes and then putting it all together. And there's a lot of that going on. Um, I think there's quite a renaissance happening and it's really exciting. So I think the future is very, very bright. I think it's wonderful that you can publish to podcast what you do because that's a really great way of getting feedback from friends and, 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 uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, people in the business, except me who's out playing the drums probably. 
Dark, it's been a wonderful conversation. Just one wee last question there from Kaylee asks if there's any way you could leak the script for the next Dick Gently show. <laughs> I told them we'll put them in the show notes. So uh... <laughs> uh, yeah, I wish. Well, you know, we I never really got I, I never got to write it. I knew exactly what I was gonna do with it. And um uh, well, you know, let's let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Maybe one day. But it was it was very unfortunate. But I had a talk with Douglas's agent, Ed Victor, after I, I had to get myself out of a situation there. That would that's really what happened. And it was a great shame that we didn't do it because I think we could have done something to, which would have at least been interesting. Um, but it was a situation I couldn't stay in for for no, nothing to do with Douglas or to do with Dirk Gently or to do with anything. It was just very awkward um, politically. Um, and I was kind of sorry about it. But then I spoke to Ed Victor, Douglas's agent, and we had a conversation in the loo at the Royal Albert Hall standing next to each other. And we kind of agreed that it was probably a good thing we didn't do it because there are certain things that, you can second guess too far, I think. So I kind of don't mind. I don't mind that. I, I'm not. I'm not. I think my my association with Douglas is pretty much over now. But there might just be one last one last. Uh, I don't know. Caber to toss. I'm trying to think of a Scots analogy. <laughs> um, uh, there may be one more thing uh, we may do, but it won't be that. Well, that's that's been really, really enjoyable, Dirk. I've, I've probably kept you enough of your day. Just before we get wrapped up, what are you? Is there anything you've got to promote? Anything you're up to at the moment? Things like that. Well, I'm doing. Um, actually, I've got a call. I've, I've got another Skype in forty minutes. I'm I'm doing a, a play, an afternoon drama for Radio Four about Patrick Moore, who was um, actually a dear friend. Uh, I knew Patrick very well. And um, I actually introduced Brian May to Patrick. They're two mates who hadn't met each other. So that was pretty productive because Brian went back and got his doctorate. Um, and we're doing a sort of a mini, not a biography as such, but the story of how Sky at Night started. And it's really fun and I'm looking forward to that. That's going, that's, we're recording that uh, in three weeks and it's going out in March. And then... There are, I would imagine it's possible we'll do another Neil Gaiman something uh, in the next sort of 12, 18 months. And I've got, what's the other thing I've got? What did I think of just then that's flown out of my head again? Oh, well, there's an animated film I'm working on, so that would be nice if that happened. But, you know, never tell God your plans. It'd probably all fall apart. Um, and there was something else. Oh, what was it? Oh, I can't remember. But anyway, oh, there might be um, another Douglasy thing. Again, I don't know. Uh, but no, the, hopefully enough to keep me, keep the mortgage paid, you know, unless I win the lottery, in which case, sod radio, I'm going to lie on the beach. So our heartfelt thanks to Dirk Manx for taking time to speak to us. There's some excellent content, and I look forward to even discussing it on the Facebook group of everybody. Hey, hey Matthew. That's right, yeah, some some fantastic content and, and thanks to the, the folks that gave me some questions as well. Uh, I'm no Michael Parkinson, so I always appreciate the, the help and support with these with these yeah. things. Yeah, so should we look at Aftermath and the, the very notion that it's too popular all of a sudden? Well, just before we do that, um, I just wanted to quickly mention, and I never ever like to go on about money and stuff. I find it a bit tedious, but at the same time, the the lights need to be kept on, the bills need to be paid. So, on the recommendation of I think it was Kessie, listener Kessie, uh, we set up a Patreon account. So what that means is people can, I th I think it's called patronize or patronize us, uh, which is a bit of a double entendre, I suppose, but uh, you can basically pledge as little or as much as you like uh, to pay for each episode. If you if you like the podcast, if you like the content uh, we're bringing to you on a weekly basis, then you can help us out by pledging a dollar an episode or a pound an episode or, or whatever you feel you can afford. Uh, these things do help us to, to pay for our hosting and running costs and you know any money we would make on top of that, we could only dream but that could be used to, to be put back and actually produce an audio drama as well. So uh, yeah. we'll put all the, the links into the show notes, but that, you know, if, if anyone could support us, 
however small they could afford, then it really would be fantastic and very much appreciated. Yeah, it would be good to be able to afford to upgrade our stuff at some point as well. I mean, like, I'll come to your place to record a lot of the big stuff, but at the same time, I could maybe upgrade stuff from my own end as well so that we're not having to rely on the one location or even even just advertising online for the, the podcast in future. You know, you want to try things like, okay, maybe not Facebook, but, you know, like you can boost your posts on Facebook that kind of thing. It just even just to keep things ticking over, I think it's a great idea. So there you go. All the notes uh, for that, well, all the all the links and things to the, the Patreon site and the show notes. And if you have any questions at all, please drop us a line at info at yapaudio.co.uk. Fabulous. So, what's next? Uh, aftermath. There was a wee bit of housekeeping on that because it's the show that we really should be done with, and we are done with it. And you know. Uh, Max Fionn's on that, very proud of it and it, it's a bit sad in a way as well that it's gone uh, yeah. but you know, it's it, the feeling of achievement is, is a nice one and certainly some of the comments we've had have been very, very nice as well and, you know, really touching Yeah, and we've made the mistake of putting out two episodes uh, too close together perhaps or even just talking about it on this uh, podcast has meant that we've had some extra uh, interest in the podcast and suddenly the downloads are uh, it's going off the scale apparently yeah and th- this is something that maybe if, if listeners are new to the show we have a we had an episode with dave jackson at the school of podcast and we talked about where to host your show and uh, we host this show on libsyn but aftermath we host on jellycast Jellycast's always been absolutely fine. It's a one-off setup fee, a very low cost. But if you hit a certain amount of uh, bandwidth per month, uh, they basically cut you off unless you pay for extra. And aftermath, suddenly, this has never happened in the, the three years we've been around, but it suddenly became so popular that uh, we had to chuck in, in the end, an extra £40. So quite pricey, really, for... Uh, the show getting popular, it's kind of bittersweet, you know, when you look at the stats and you're almost thinking, like, stop downloading the show, stop liking the show. Uh, you should never you should never feel like that, should you? No, and, you know, we couldn't even say to people, oh, go to our SoundCloud accounts or something or we'll send you a transfer by email or something instead, but so what can you do, I guess? Um, but I imagine all of our hosting will be with Libsyn in future because you seem very happy with the service now. Yeah, I really, really like Libsyn. Uh, the support's fantastic. The service is fantastic. Uh, I would say the, the the big pro of Jellycast over Libsyn is if you weren't doing anything for years, you know, no podcasting at all, uh, it wouldn't cost you a penny. But uh, if, if you were in the same scenario with Libsyn, you would still have to pay a couple of pounds a month just to keep your account open and keep your feed alive. But you know, you weigh these things up. I, I certainly think the position we're in, we're never going to be not putting out content uh, on a regular basis. So it's Libsyn for us, definitely. But uh, everyone's different. You know, there's a lot of good hosting platforms out there. So, uh, you know, I'm not I'm not telling anyone what to do by any means. No, no that's been our experience in the, the few instances where we've approached hosting for the first time, really. So who knows, there may well be many other options that are suitable to people's needs. So uh, that's our feedback. And by all means, let us know if you're hosting uh, in different areas, what your experience has been, because it will be useful to share, I think. One of the things we haven't talked too much about is hosting, because you'd have thought there wasn't too much to it. But when it comes down to having problems and then requiring support, suddenly it does get a little bit more complex. So just before we, we get wrapped up, just wanted to give a couple of heads up to some of the, the folks that have enjoyed Aftermath over the last uh, week or so. We've had some really, really nice comments, like I said. Yeah, uh, I'll start off with Doug Brown's comment. He uh, he said he listened on the drive into work today, that, this is a few days ago, and he says he's still processing the ending, not at all what he was expecting. And he ended up dreaming about it. The ending, so that's uh, <laughs> that's a new one for us, isn't it? Well, it's it's really really nice to hear that, and I think as as content creators, as fiction creators, and as audio drama creators, ultimately you've got this fantastic opportunity to tell your story, 
not through somebody's eyes, but actually inside their brain. It's, it's such an intimate medium. Uh, you're in there, in their thoughts, and uh, you could create something that people, it, it really will have an impact on them. Uh, and for Doug to go and dream about the show, you know, that's uh, it's quite a, a nice thing to hear. It really is. And uh, thanks for that, Doug. I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed the show. And who else? Matthew J. Boudreau, the man I like to call Matty J, but he doesn't like it. But that aside, uh, what was he saying about season two? Yeah, he said that it, it really raised the bar, you know, in terms of the, the sound quality. He says he was really impressed by, well, the improvement in quality. And that means a lot coming for Matthew because he's a great, great sound man, a sound engineer, sound designer, worked on some fantastic projects and uh, yeah, for him to say that is, is really nice as well. Uh, yeah. We also heard from Chris Neal on Facebook who said he just finished Aftermath and whoa. So uh, again, <laughs> that old ending uh, ruffled a few feathers, I suppose. Yeah, and it was a different ending to the one we very originally knew very early on, the one we originally conceived, wasn't it? But we kind of played about with it and had a couple of different endings, I suppose, and I'm glad that we went with the one we've got uh, without giving anything away. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Steve, Steve Schneider, uh, yes. friend of the show. Lots of great constructive feedback from Steve. He appreciated the improvement of quality as the show moved into season two after the, the year's hiatus. And, you know, we, we did have a year where we didn't release a single episode between the two seasons. I'm glad we did that because we really... When we came back for season two, I'm really, really happy with the whole thing, you know, from start to finish. I think it sounds mm -hmm. really good. I don't mind saying that. Uh, it took a long time to get there. Uh, we certainly made some not-so-great content on hindsight, but uh, it's all about improvement and learning, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And there were a few things that he noted in his feedback, like uh, scene transitions uh, and referring back to things that had happened, but he didn't remember it happening because it, we didn't actually have it happen in the scene, if you like. We just had characters referring back to it, in particular the death of Chris's girlfriend. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, so it's it, Yeah, it's not all, you know, the mistakes we made and the things that we aren't too happy with looking back. It's not just production, you know, it's writing as well. Mm -hmm. Well, that was out of necessity, though, as well, because we decided to move away from those characters and uh, and we had our reasons. So, uh, you know, we'll improve on that in the future because we'll have a, a you know, we'll, we'll make different choices when it comes to character creation and even, dare I say it, casting as well without going into too much detail. So it's, it's all part of a, a huge and complex learning curve. Absolutely. Um, on the other social network, Twitter, where you can find us at Yap Audio. Uh, Sandra King said, love the series. Sorry it had to end and can't wait for the next one. Uh, thanks for that, Sandra. That's that's really appreciated to hear as well. Yeah. Um, what is the next one? I was just saying to Kessie actually today that we have about four or five scripts at least that are not quite scripts but outlines and we're not entirely sure what the next big series is going to be, a bit, apart from a few one-offs, of course, but it's an interesting time, a pregnant pause, if you will. Yeah, I mean, I mentioned this on the Facebook group, and then please join the Facebook group, Audio Drama Production Podcast, and it was just last week when we finished the last episode, and I was asking people, is this a thing that, that other people experience where you finish a project that you've just spent so much time on over the last maybe two months, and we were, you know, spending maybe eight, nine, ten hours a day working on it. And instead of feeling a sense of euphoria when you finally get it out, you just feel drained and you don't really feel happy at all. Um, and then I was opening up Word documents. I was typing out a synopsis for a story. I'd maybe write a couple of scenes to see what I thought. And then I'm tearing them up and deleting them. And, uh, you know, I, I just felt a bit creatively bankrupt. And we ended up, uh, my wife and I went up to Pitlochry in the Highlands the weekend. I got her a camera for Christmas. So we went up there and just chilled out, took some pictures and got out for a few walks. And you come back and the, the feedback that we're going over, I was reading through that. And 
you start to feel good about things again and then ideas start to germinate. So I suppose you, you do just need that wee, you know, you need to step away sometimes, don't you? Yeah, like ending a relationship and you don't want to go into another relationship. You need that time to reflect and really find yourself. Uh, you don't want to go on the rebound and suddenly start making a, a fantasy epic and then, you know, for all the wrong reasons. So I think it'll be good to relax a little bit and, and even see what else is out there and get some ideas. And we've been jotting ideas down and it'll be good. It, it It's funny how we didn't feel as good as we should have done at the end of Aftermath compared to high points throughout the series where we were really pleased with what we were achieving and looking forward to putting that into practice for the next episode, but it it's all over now. So it's kind of a, a bittersweet moment, as I think you put. Yeah, uh, the final comment, uh, just uh, a friend of ours again on Twitter with the show Fire on the Mound had a yeah. show listen through the series as well. So again, thank you so much for, for taking the time to do that, and I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, so I guess... We can only ride on the coattails of Aftermath for so long before we have to really start making something else, eh? Yeah, that's it. What was the... Uh, was it the Stone Roses that had one album out for years and years? Or was that... Uh, Could have been. Guns and Roses as well. Not yeah. one album, but they, they had quite a break, didn't they? So, yeah, uh, that's true. Uh, Oasis, even. They had two fairly decent albums and then... Uh, by their own admission, they were more interested in extracurricular activities when it comes to being uh, famous musicians compared to what they really should have been putting their energy into, which is music. So, um, yeah, can't hang around. Better start writing. If anybody's got any ideas, maybe we could write a sequel to Sister Act 2 or something. See if we could pitch that. Sister Act 3, the audio drama. Uh, I'll, find, I'll have a think about that. On that note, I suppose I don't I don't think there's anything else to get through, and it's been a a big old episode. But I really hope you've enjoyed it. And if you're still listening, even though Dirk's gone and it's just us, uh, thank you for that. You're probably in a minority, but uh, <laughs> you know you you do get people that stay to the end. Yeah, I I hope so, and uh, bless you one and all. We'll catch you next week. Hopefully, we'll um have some equally exciting content uh, i'm thinking of uh, maybe making it a writing centric one again where we come up with some hints and tips or something but stay tuned you'll see notes of it on the the facebook group can't stress enough how often we're on there we are on there get us there in the meantime we'll catch you next time yeah enjoy your week and remember to eat your five a day